Good afternoon. Um, I'm Natalie. I'm Knowledge Exchange Manager for Horticulture at AHDB. Welcome to this webinar on tomato brown rugose fruit virus. Today we're hoping to provide you with a bit of an update on what we currently know about this virus and what plans are in place to mitigate for this threat to tomato and pepper production in the UK. Um, during the webinar, there's the facility to ask questions. You can do this by um, typing into the question tab on the menu. We'll answer questions at the end of each um, of the sessions with Heiko and with Sharon. Um, if you encounter any problems during the webinar, um, or you'd like to ask further questions after the webinar has finished, please feel free to email me um, on natalie.key at ahdb.org.uk. Um, for information, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to view on AHDB's Horticulture's YouTube channel. Um, after the event, I'll put the link on the AHDB's dedicated Tomato Brown Rigose Fruit Virus website alongside the other resources that are currently available for this. Um, I will now pass over to Adrian Fox from FERA, who will provide us with um, an introduction to the virus and also host the remainder of the webinar. So we hope you enjoy it. Over to you, Adrian. Good afternoon. Um, as Natalie said, my name is Adrian Fox from Ferrer in York. Um, and this afternoon, we're also joined by Heiko Seibel from uh, Braunschweig in Germany. And also with me here in York is Sharon Matthews Berry from DEFRA. I thought we'd start with uh, some introduction and background to the, the virus itself. So I'll take you through this and then Heiko will spend some time um, giving some background to the problems that they've experienced in Germany with the virus over the last year. And then we'll finish with Sharon talking about the regulatory aspects for the UK. So I thought we'd start with some basics, uh, bring us all up to speed. So to ask the question, what is a virus? Well, these are sub-microscopic infectious agents. They have a very simple structure. At their simplest, they are simply some um, DNA or RNA genetic code, and that's surrounded by a protein code. Viruses reproduce within the cells of a living host, and they cannot reproduce outside of those cells. Um, so they use the cell's own replication mechanisms uh, to, to reproduce, um, and from that point forward, they generally go systemic within a host. There are around 5,000 recognized viruses, and there are many thousands being reported every year. Um, and there are different viruses recorded in all species. Uh, so that's animal, fungal, and plant. They generally do not cross kingdoms, so you don't get animal viruses that infect plants, and you don't get plant viruses that infect humans. Um, and very few viruses cause major problems. However, when they do, they can cause major economic damage, as we see quite often with plant viruses. So tomato brown rugose fruit virus is a Tabamo virus. And again, just to give you some background to Tabamo viruses, uh, these were among the first plant viruses to be characterized. Uh, we know that they're seed transmitted at high levels in untreated seed. And once they're in a crop, mechanical transmission would be the main route. So that's either contact between plants or through plant handling activity, cutting and so on. Um, Tabama viruses are highly stable and they can persist for long periods of time outside of their host. And just to give you an idea of how stable some of the Tabama viruses are, they are viable in dried leaf material for over 10 years. Um, some work done in the 1960s looked at the sputum of chronic smokers and that was shown to be contaminated with viable tobacco mosaic virus. And also pepper mild mosaic virus um, has been suggested as a marker of fecal pollution or for water treatment efficacy, given that it will pass through the human body and will still be detectable in water courses afterwards. And there are several Tabama viruses linked to commercially damaging outbreaks in plants, such as tobacco and tomato mosaic virus in tomato crops. However, these are largely contrailed through use of resistant varieties. If we think about tomato brown rugose fruit virus specifically, the reason that it's causing so much concern is that it can overcome the TMV resistance genes in tomato. 
it's spread through mechanical and contacts such as plant handling and also recently bumblebee transmission has been demonstrated. Once it's present within a crop, it spreads rapidly and I think we'll have Heiko to, to testify to that as we go through the afternoon. And also seed transmission is implicated but not yet proven. Once plants are infected, they cannot be cured. Um, and so prophylactic hygiene measures are used to try and minimize the risk of spread and to also limit the impact should an outbreak occur. And tomato brown ghost fruit virus has also been recorded on pepper crops. It's very much an emerging problem and only been known around for about for around five years. So the first outbreak was recorded in Israel in 2014 and the virus is now present in all tomato growing regions of Israel. Later it was reported in Jordan, there have been outbreaks in Mexico and an outbreak in California and there are also outbreaks in Europe, in Sicily and Germany as we'll hear about later. And at present we're investigating unconfirmed reports from both Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, which, as I said, we don't have official reports for these, um, just anecdotal reports through the trade press. So a quick think about the symptoms, and one of the problems is that the symptoms on fruit can be very similar to Papino mosaic virus. But the virus is named after the brown wrinkled rugose patches which can develop on affected fruit. Symptoms can vary with variety. And so you get mosaics such as chlorotic or pale patches on younger leaves and side shoots. Leaves can be crumpled and deformed or maybe narrowed. And you get brown necrotic streaks on stems. But as I said, the fruit can develop marbling symptoms which can appear similar to Pepino mosaic. But if you look on the AHDB website, there's a poster of symptoms and further information on the virus. And this, as Natalie said, is where the uh, web webinar will be uh, signposted later. So I'll now pass over to Heiko in Germany, who will give us uh, some background to the situation in Germany. Good afternoon, I'm Heiko Seibel. I work for the Julius Kühn Institute in Germany, and we've been involved with some of the detection of tomato brown fruit, rugus fruit virus last year due, due to an outbreak in Germany. And now you should be able to see my slides. Is that correct, um, Adrian? Yes, that's correct. I thought. Okay, perfect. So as Adrian has um, already said in the introduction, um, tomato brown rugose fruit virus belongs to the group of tobamo viruses. Uh, and that group includes many, many um, viruses that infect uh, commercially important crops like tobacco mosaic virus, tomato mosaic virus, cucumber green mottle mosaic virus, odontoglossum ring spot virus, just to name a few. And more importantly for us is that this new virus infects plants that are resistant to TMV and to TOMV. The described host plants are not only tomatoes but bell pepper, Petunia, Solanum nigra, the black nightshade, tobacco species and xenopodium species, but the infection may not always cause visible symptoms, such in the case of Petunia. So you might have an infected Petunia, um, but you cannot uh, tell that this plant is infected if you look at symptoms only. So, sorry Hi, to interrupt. Oh, sorry. Can you present your screen? I think, don't think we can see your presentation presented. Oh, it's, we've lost it completely now. Oh, I'm very sorry. It is okay if you could just um, click. Let us start slide. again. I think if you just go into the slideshow format. So if you go into the bottom corner and hit the. No, I think it's just on the. Oh, there we go. Yep. OK, so you. Um, you might not be able to see visible symptoms in some of the host plants that can infect it with the virus. Um, 
The virus was first found and reported in Jordan, but the outbreak in Israel was actually one year earlier, but it was only reported in 2017. And last year in August, we had the first reports from uh, Germany, and that was the first description of this virus from Europe. And since then, Adrian also has said, we found the virus in Sicily, California, and Mexico. In August last year, tomato growers in North Rhine-Westphalia were affected, and in particular, there were seven growers that produced on more than 25 acres um, of greenhouse space tomatoes. And we had a rapid spread of infection, not only within the greenhouses, but also between production sites. The Julius Kühn Institute is responsible for the pest risk analysis and a high phytosanitary risk was identified with this virus and therefore it was decided to uh, treat to Mato Brown rugose food virus as quarantine pathogen with all the me measurements that need to be taken in place. That means all the affected plant material had to be cleared and destroyed. And luckily it was uh, towards the end of the tomato growing season. So the damages were not as bad as they could have been. All greenhouse spaces were disinfected, but that included also transportation boxes, tools, and so on and so on. And a couple of outreach activities uh, were done. Um, the Plant Protection Agency from North Rhine's failure uh, published some newsletters and articles with hands-on advice to the growers. And uh, we are um, producing a fact sheet, which hopefully will be launched soon. Um, there is a new um, a series uh, where we want to do little fact sheets for different diseases. So hopefully um, that will uh, be published in the next few days. And we are also thinking of translating that into English if uh, required. The symptoms can be quite unspecific or even unsymptomatic on leaves, but sometimes, as already Adrian said, you see a mosaic pattern. You can have smaller leaves, blistering. Um, in some plant varieties, we see wilting and uh, let in the end plant death. The symptoms on fruits are more prominent with brownish and yellowish discoloration. But as I said, these symptoms can be variety dependent and other viruses may cause similar symptoms such as pepino mosaic virus or physis degia chlorotic model virus. And uh, most of you know that pepino mosaic virus is um, using a mild strain for cross protection. So many, many tomato plants within Europe are now infected on purpose with pepino mosaic virus. And at the time it was quite unclear if those symptoms were caused by this uh, cross protection induction um, or by a new virus. Just an example of the Physostegia chlorotic model virus, if you look at these tomato fruits, the symptoms are very, very similar to those um, induced on by a tomato brown rugose fruit virus. The transmission can occur by seeds and therefore also by young plants and more importantly by mechanical means and that involves all the tools, hands and handling, packaging boxes, knives, closed irrigation systems, and so on and so on. And recently it was also described that bumblebees used for pollination of tomato plants can transmit the virus within a greenhouse. And uh, Adrian has the same resource as I. Um, these particles are extremely stable and even the sputum of smokers can contain viable um, particles of tobacco mosaic virus, and we therefore believe that this new tobacco virus um, has very, very similar properly properties and is also extremely stable. At the moment, we have three ways of diagnostics available, electron microscopy, RT-PCR, and ELISA, and I will um, talk a little bit in more detail about all these different routes. So electron microscopy can discover these virus particles in infected plant tissue. 
What I've shown here is a photograph from my colleague, Dr. Richard Pergela, and um, what you can see is the purified tomato brown rubus fruit virus particles. These are not uh, samples taken from a plant. If you have a plant leaf, the detection might be even more difficult because you don't have that many particles available or um, you have used not the correct um, uh, leaf where maybe the particles are not present in high concentrations. However, electron microscopy is non-specific. Um, we cannot distinguish by the look um, at this photograph whether um, this is tomato brown rubus fruit virus or TMV or any of the other Tobamo viruses. If you have um, antisera available, you might be able to do an immunosorbent electron microscopy, thus fishing the virus particle out of infected leaf tissue, or you may be able to do a decoration, but this all depends on the um, antisera. And I will talk about the antisera in a couple of minutes. For Diagnostics using RT-PCR at the moment, um, we recommend using group-specific tobamovirus primers followed by sequencing. Um, there are quite a few publications available with generic primers that uh, can detect a whole range of tobamoviruses, and I've uh, named a few here. Um, but some of these primer pairs produce non-specific bands, even from healthy controls. We also tried the tomato brown rubus fruit virus specific primers from Luria et al. But those primers might not be detecting all the um, strain of this virus. So this is a comparison of two generic Tobamo virus primers. And uh, you can see here that uh, the primer pair from Lee et al. is able to detect um, infected plant tissue from tomatoes and tobaccos that were inoculated by us with the tomato brown fruit rubus virus. Um, the healthy controls look fine. We do not get unspecific amplification, but if we use the primers that were published by both Menzel et al., we do get some unspecific bands in the healthy controls. And of course, that's a bit of a nightmare for a diagnostician because this is not a clear negative. And uh, in any case, we suggest that you uh, cut out these bands and send them for sequencing because these uh, assays do not tell you which of the uh, many Tobamo viruses is present in your sample. We also used um, a couple of other Tobamo viruses with these primer pairs. And um, for us, the Lee et al. primers work quite well. They detected a whole range of Tobamo viruses, while, uh, while this uh, primer pair failed to detect uh, cucumber green um, mild model virus. And I spoke to Wolf, and he said that he designed these primers many years ago when there were only limited sequences available. Um, online, and therefore um, they might not detect all Tobamo viruses. So if in doubt, I think it's always good to use a couple of different primers. Uh, both work fine for the rubrose virus, as I can show you here, but it depends on the diagnostic protocol that you are using. Um, we started off uh, out with a one-step RT-PCR protocol and uh, we knew that three samples named 17, 18, and 19 were definitely infected with the rubus uh, fruit virus, uh, but only one out of three samples were positive when we used these specific primers. None of the samples came up when we used the Lee et al. primers, but when we repeated um, the protocol as a two-step RT-PCR protocol with exactly the same primers, all three samples came up positive, and the likely explanation is that um, there is a denaturing step necessary at the very first beginning um, that uh, we include in the two-step protocol, but not in the one-step protocol. And at the moment, we are using um, this as our first line of diagnostics, and this protocol as a second line of confirmation test. 
At the moment, there is only a limited availability of anti-Sera from us and the DSMZ. And the Israeli people have also produced their anti-Sera um, against tomato brown rubus fruit virus. But as far as I know, now it's not uh, commercially available. The problem with anti-Sera is that they are often cross-reacting with other Tobamo viruses, so there is no specific detection of this particular virus possible, um, but it is suitable for mass screening of young plants, for example, and then if you find something you need to uh, confirm with other means that it's the rubus fruit virus or any of the other Tobamo viruses. What can be done as prevention or as treatment? Adrian said, treatment is not possible. Once the plant is infected, it stays infected and you can only uh, destroy it. At the moment, no resistant uh, tomato varieties are known and we can only recommend that you use a very, very strict hygiene um, program in your facilities. Closely observe observe young plants, new young plants, or any other plant material. If you see any suspicious symptoms, contact your plant health advisor and um, test uh, your plants if you suspect a virus outbreak. If the tomato brown rubus fruit virus infection is confirmed, all plant material needs to be destroyed and not composted. The Tobamo viruses are not inactivated by composting. And uh, yeah, all tools, tables, trays, greenhouse facilities uh, need to be disinfected. Um, in Germany, we have only one product that is licensed as a virocide uh, that is um, licensed against the treat or for the treatment against TMV. And at the moment, there are no data available if this disinfectant is equally um, uh, sufficient to get rid of uh, any uh, tomato brown rubus fruit virus particles in your greenhouse. Um, but it seems to work because the eradication program was quite successful. Do not reuse rock wool or other substrates uh, used in tomato production. Um, there's only little experience available regarding the treatment of irrigation water. There are different methods available, such UV disinfection, filters or heat treatment. Um, they may reduce the virus load, but not eliminate. Um, there is no data currently available um, that can show that uh, Tobamo viruses are completely destroyed using these technologies. When you look at the workers, it might be advisable to uh, supply them with disposable coats, heads and gloves for handling the uh, plants in the greenhouse. And uh, probably it's also a good idea to tell them not to eat tomatoes or peppers for lunch that have been brought in from supermarkets um, where we have no control from which countries these uh, tomatoes or peppers are coming from, and they might uh, be a potential source of infection. When we look at the um, affected area, so far no reoccurrence of the virus outbreak has occurred. Um, so the disinfection management seems to have worked quite successfully. Uh, they People are monitoring their plants and they are using um, randomized testing um, to detect a potential 1% infection in their crop. And they are using uh, ELISA with the DSMZ antibodies and pool 25 samples. You can imagine if you have thousands or tens of thousands of plants, um, you need to cut it back to a sizable or manageable size for sampling. We had another suspected outbreak in a tomato breeding facility at the beginning of the year, but this could not be confirmed. Um, but interestingly, we found something, up, um, something else, a new record for Germany, the southern tomato virus. And I spoke to Adrian last week and he said that uh, there you also found this probably in the UK. It's not surprising 
because this southern tomato virus um, has a double-stranded RNA genome, but it's not known that there is an associated capsid or a shell. And therefore, this virus cannot be detected by electron microscopy, nor by ELISA or other um, serological tests. And the transmission rates by seeds are very high, up to 90%. And at the moment, no other vectors are known. And um, yeah, this virus seems to be a bit peculiar. Um, some say there is an asthmatic uh, infection um, of plants that have this virus. Um, others say that fruits can be smaller when compared to healthy plants. Um, we have not, because this uh, detection is so recent that we could not have done any um, experiments with this virus, but it has been recorded worldwide, um, including Canary Islands, Spain, France, Italy. Those are the European countries, but there are also reports from the United States and so on and so on. Um, JKI again did a, a press PRA and decided it's not a quarantine organism. No eradication has to be uh, made because um, the effect on plants, if at all, seems to be very minor. And then I come to my end. I just want to acknowledge my staff who have worked tremendously in the last few weeks on the diagnostics. Um, side of this uh, virus and um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Heiko. <clears throat> uh, we've got lots of questions for you, if that's any, um, if you're happy to answer them. Yeah, so, that's fine. Uh, one question, will the German fact sheet be made available for UK growers? Uh, we can we are uh, discussing to also translate into english and um it's an old publishing series from jki that we are currently reviving um and therefore we had a lot um uh, yeah um issues with the with the layout and so on but we are in the final proof stage so hopefully the german version will be available next week or the week after and then we can work on the translation um, it will be um, uh, pu pu open public access on our website fantastic um, a diagnostic question or a couple of diagnostic questions yeah um, so why did you use electron microscopy if you cannot use it to specifically identify the virus I think that's, was it because it was an unknown? Um, for the samples that we get in at the time, it was an unknown virus and uh, tomatoes can be infected by 40 or 50 different viruses. And therefore um, we do not have the capacity to do 40 to 50 specific tests. Um, but if we use electron microscopy as a first line of diagnostics and we see uh, whether they are rod-shaped particles, flexuous particles or icosahedral particles, that narrows down um, the second line of testing where we then can start with um, specific tests and uh, use, for example, RT-PCR protocols. But it's a case-to-case -case, uh, decision that we make. If we get the question, is uh, uh, brown, fruit, brown fruit rugose virus in these uh, plants or not, of course, we start straight away with the RT-PCR protocol. Okay. So, um, do, would the diagnostics allow you to rapidly detect the disease in transplants before they were dispatched to growers? Should be. Um, we haven't tested any uh, young plants or seedlings yet, um, but I do think that the uh, diagnostic protocols are sensitive enough even to detect uh, the virus in low titer. Okay, so it, it should be, but the test just needs some validation. How long does it take to get a PCR identification? Uh, the 
if you use the generic primers, I think you can have the result within the day, but then you still do not know uh, what type of Tobamo virus is in your plant. And uh, depending on um, your, we use a commercial sequencing provider, it takes another uh, day or two to receive the sequences that need to be analyzed. And to be on the safe side, we say within a week you get a result and a confirmatory test. Okay. And using your approach, could a lab come up with a wrong analytical result? Um, this virus is very difficult because of the risk of cross-contamination and especially with the Tomamo viruses you always have a risk of cross-contamination so if you have for example a smoker collecting the leaf samples with bare hands you might have TMV on the plant sample that was not present in the plant, but you will, of course, detect that with uh, RT-PCR. Um, we are lucky that we have not had any cross-contamination in our laboratory as yet, but we are very, very careful when we handle these samples. Okay, and also the, the sequencing should help give confidence. Yes, that's why we yeah. say um, sequencing must be done to really identify what type of Tudabamo virus you get in your plant. Um, the risk with the specific primers is that um, there might be variations of the virus around um, that might not be detected with this specific primer sequence and therefore we prefer to use the generic um, uh, yeah, Tudabamo virus primers. The published sequences are very similar, so it doesn't matter if you have a virus from Jordan, from Israel, or from Germany, they are very, very um, uh, similar, but um, I fear that if you have this, um, as I have shown in the um, one-step RT-PCR protocol, we did not understand why we got only one out of three samples positive, and then we decided to just work with the generic um, uh, primers full stop. Okay, um, we've got loads and loads of questions, but in the interest of sticking to time for now, uh, around the disinfectant. Pardon? So we've got lots of people asking if you can tell us what the disinfection is. We have lots of people asking if you can tell which disinfectant it is that's used yeah. in Germany? Uh, it's called Menoflorades, and um, I, uh, if you Google it, you should find their website. They have a couple of um, uh, um, information on their website. Uh, this is their sheet, so uh, there you find the name written in green, and they have done. Uh, quite a few tests of the disinfectant and the um, efficiency against fungi, viruses and bacteria, and they are currently the only licensed uh, um, uh, product in Germany. Uh, I know that there are some reports available that you should, that you can use skimmed milk or um, other products, soapy uh, uh, products, but none of them are licensed, and so we um, do not recommend using those uh, um, disinfectants because we have no hard data supporting the efficiency of these products. And if you use skimmed milk powder, you do not have batch continuity, can, batch continuity. So um, please use only uh, licensed products and we do not have any um, experiments at the moment um, where alternatives have been tested. Okay. Okay. We've got plenty of other questions around things like sources and quarantine status, but I think yeah. we'll probably come back to those once we've heard from Sharon, if that's sure. okay. Yeah. So what I will do now is switch from Heiko to Sharon and let her introduce herself and we'll go from there.
Right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sharon Matthews Bowie from DEFRA. Um, does that look okay? Is my screen? Can't see my presentation. Okay. Right. Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Matthews Berry and I'm from the Risk and Horizon Scanning Team in DEFRA. Um, and I'll talk a bit about um, the sort of uh, regulatory aspects of this, but there also will be some overlap with some of the other presentations in terms of talking about distribution and the background to the, to the pathogen. Okay, so as we've already heard, this um, virus was first described in the Middle East in 2015. It's closely related to tobacco mosaic virus and tobacco mosaic virus. Um, it was added to the UK plant health risk register following the first findings in Europe, which was the outbreak in Germany last year. Since then, the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, EPO, have added it to their alert list. And for a sort of future, EPO are also planning to produce a pest risk assessment, and this will be developed later in 2019. And this will be a risk assessment for the whole EPO region for this virus. And I've just added at the bottom there a couple of links. This is the link to the UK Plant Health Risk Register entry and also to the EPO Global Database, where you can get some more information on the virus. So in terms of distribution, tomato brown rugeous fruit virus has a very um, scattered global distribution. And this means it, it may be pleasant, present in other countries, but it has gone undetected. It also, there also is um, the issue of the limited speci specificity of the ELISA test and positive results may have been reported as tobacco mosaic virus. It was first described in 2015 in glass houses in Jordan. It's since then been identified in Israel, where it's been probably been present since 2014. It was found in Mexico in 2018. As you've heard about the six, seven outbreaks in, in Germany last year, and more recently, there's been outbreaks in Sicily and Italy. It's only two natural hosts have been identified of uh, tomato brown rosaceous fruit virus. This is tomatoes, and in Mexico, it's been identified in chili peppers. Um, there's been experimental inoculation carried out, which shows that symptoms are developed on varieties which have the resistance to tomato and tobacco mosaic virus, and also symptoms are developed on peppers which carry the resistance genes for tobacco viruses. There are other experimental hosts which have been reported, uh, chenopodiums, nicotinia, petunia, and black nightshade. Just on this next slide, I was just going to talk a bit about the impacts that's been seen in different outbreaks. So firstly, the outbreaks in Israel in 2014. These were found in six mesh net houses, a total area of approximately 30 acres. The tomatoes there were seen to have mosaic leaf symptoms, which were described as mild to severe, and also occasional leaf narrowing. Uh, fruit symptoms were seen on 10 to 15% of the total harvested fruit. Um, and the affected fruit were yellow and described as being yellow and spotted. Uh, experimentally, tomatoes carrying the resistant gene to, to tobacco and to, uh, tomato mosaic virus were also found to be infected. And it was also noted there that the symptoms were not the same on all cultivars. In Jordan in 2015, this was again an outbreak in a glasshouse crop which showed 100% infection. The symptoms, the foliar symptoms were only considered to be mild, but there was strong brown rugeous symptoms on the fruit. To carry on with the impacts, there was also the outbreaks in Mexico. And this is obviously slightly different because this is not only tomatoes, but also the chili peppers. Um, again, we're talking about mosaic symptoms and yellowing on the leaves. And fruit symptoms were seen on both crops, which were described as yellowing, green spots, grooves, irregular brown spots and deformation of the fruit. To come on to the outbreaks in Europe, we've heard about the outbreaks in Germany already. Um, 
the information I, I have is that we've seen folia symptoms have been seen there. And there's fruit with yellow spots and sometimes rugia symptoms. I think from the initial outbreaks, we're talking about 10% of plants being affected in the glass house and showing symptoms. Um, recent information, I've, I've heard that these outbreak, from these outbreaks, the plants have been um, incinerated and the, and the premises disinfected. And planting has resumed using tested plants, I've been told. Um, and no further symptoms have been observed. And there's further testing planned. The, the more recent outbreak is in Sicily, in Italy. Um, this is some quite new information I've got hold of only this morning. Um, there's outbreaks at five production, fruit production nurseries, and then also at two nurseries producing young plants. Um, from the original outbreak, it was described as being uh, about 10% of plants infected. That was 600 of 6,000 were symptomatic. The symptoms were judged not to be severe. But um, some new information, which is what I've got this morning, is that um, in, a batch of infected seeds has been identified at one of the nurseries. Um, so this is the seed has been tested and um, the tomato brown rugeous fruit virus has been identified on it. And these seeds were, considered, were described as being sourced from one batch from an EU member state and the other one from Peru. And as I mentioned before, the tomato brown rugeous fruit virus has been added to the UK plant health risk register. And in the next couple of slides, I'll go through the criteria which were considered in making that assessment. Oh. OK, sorry, I've just turned off the red. Adrian's just asked me to turn off the red webcam because I've got a very slow connection. So I'll just go with the, the slides now. So when the risk register entry is assessed, um, there's different criteria that are looked at. The first one is, is the risk of entry. And so in this case, it was considered that the risk of entry would be due to either infected plants for planting or infected seeds. Now, as we've heard before, seed transmission has not been demonstrated, but it's quite strongly implied that it can be seed transmissible. Um, it's known that other Tabama mosaic viruses are seed borne, including the closely related tobacco and tomato mosaic virus. And there's anecdotal suggestions that seed was the pathway of introduction into Mexico. There's also the new information that infected seed has been identified in Italy. We then look at the possibility for establishment in the UK. Um, we don't see any reason why this wouldn't establish in the UK. The hosts are grown here and as it's a protected crop, there is no issue of climate. So there's nothing that's likely to limit the possibility of establishment in the UK. So then we look at some evidence for spread. There's data on spread available from Israel. It was first detected in the country in October 2014. By February 2015, there are records scattered throughout the centre center of Israel. By November 2016, their positive dissections are found in the stream, extreme north. Now, the spread was considered to be human aided, either by agronomists moving between sites and or by the trade in infected seeds or young plants. Um, in terms of vectoring it, Dabama mosaic viruses are usually considered not to need vectors, but there is some evidence that bumblebees can infect plants with tobacco brown rouges, tomato brown rouges fruit virus although it's unclear whether this is due to infected pollen or mechanical transmission. And the other criteria that we'd look at in terms of the risk register entry is the impact. And based on the current information concerning fruits, because current information we have, there are the possibility of fruit symptoms that could render the infected fruit unmarketable. So also when producing a risk register entry, we would look at what current mitigations are in place. Um, and this is what's in the current, currently in the legislation. So from our current legislation, we have that solanaceous plants for planting are prohibited from countries outside Europe and the Mediterranean. However, from the current known distribution, only Mexico is outside that European and Mediterranean Union. European and Mediterranean area. So the prohibition against planting material 
is unlikely to have any impact on the movement of infected young plants. Also, this prohibition does not cover seeds. Seeds can be imported from any part of the range of the virus. But the requirement for seeds is that they must be acid extracted or have undergone equivalent measures. As a seed-borne Tabama mosaic virus, they're usually carried on the seed coat, though it's not known whether this applies to this virus. So acid extraction may reduce the chances of infected seed entering the UK. When a risk register entry is assessed, it also looks at uncertainties associated with assess assessment. And in this case, the key uncertainties would be, the first one would be seed-borne transmission not being demonstrated. Um, in addition, there are uncertainties concerning the distribution. The full global distribution of the virus is likely to be greater than is currently known. In terms of hosts, it's are there additional naturally infected hosts out there? Uh, in particular, are there latently infected hosts which could be asymptomatic and act as a reservoir for infection? And then in terms of the pathways for entry, I think we come back to the, the seedborne, the issue of the seedborne uh, pathway being unproven. And also, if it is seedborne, does the acid extraction have any, any effect in reducing the rate of infection? So possible future action. So this virus was discussed at the EU Plant Health Standing Committee last week, and there was support for developing emergency measures against it. Uh, it's considered that those emergency measures would focus on the input on seeds and the import of plants. Um, the aim is to discuss the exact nature of these measures at the next standing committee in May next month. So just to come on a bit to some possible options of what action would be taken if we did have an outbreak in the UK, um, it's considered that we would take statutory action against this virus. Therefore, action would be under plant health notice and supervised by the Plant Health and Seeds Inspectorate. Um, I'm just putting together some ideas of the sort of measures we would take, but this is only, this is only really for guidance because the exact measures would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, um, taking into account the circumstances of the outbreak. It would be similar action to what we've taken in the past against potato spindle tuber viroid or columnia latent viroid. So possible action would include um, the possibility of restriction on movement of fruit, but in terms of movement of fruit, that would only be restrictions of not allowing it to move to another production site for repacking. There would be no, we wouldn't envisage, envisage any restrictions on marketing of the fruit to wholesale or retail. It's, it's just as a, there, there is a possibility of spread from one production site to another via fruit. Um, it also look at restrictions on movements of staff. So I think it was mentioned um, that in Germany, there was a lot of spread about on sites. And so I think we would look at putting in place some requirements to prevent the movement of staff, for example, from an infected glass house into an uninfected one. Um, and also, putting in place hygiene protocols concerning wearing protective clothing, um, in particular gloves and changing these when you move from visually infected plants to visually uninfected plants. And would also think also require um, cleaning and disinfection of tools to prevent movement between infected and uninfected houses and movement within infected glass houses. The main control will be looking at a cleanup at the end of the season. Um, we'd look at removal of plant debris. Um, I think measures that we would definitely say would be fine for disposal of the plants would be burning, deep burial, and composting, so long as it was a, a past 100 standard composting site. But other methods could be considered in consultation with the PHSI. Um, just to ensure they're appropriate. Uh, other associated material would need to be removed and destroyed. Um, for example, string, if it's biodegradable, it could go with the home. 
Uh, rock wall, we would likely require that recycling for non-horticultural purposes. And then we would talk about um, the cleaning and disinfection of the glass house. And I think in addition to disinfectant, we would recommend cleaning with water and detergent to remove traces of organic matter, because this is something, I, I, a point I'm often making, regardless of the crop, regardless of the, the pathogen, that disinfectants are, off, disinfectants are often inactivated by the presence of organic matter. So it's very important to clean surfaces prior to disinfection. Um, another important requirement would be ensuring that any um, self-sown tomato seeds were prevented from germinating um, to ensure that when you're introducing a new crop into the glass house, there's not old infected plants growing up uh, anywhere. And um, additionally, once a new crop was introduced, there would need to be monitoring for the presence of these self-sown seeds and additionally for symptoms within that new crop. Right, just really to conclude, um, this is a developing situation. There's obviously the potential for new EU emergency measures. There's also an EPO-PRA, which is um, going to be developed in the future. Um, and because we're looking at something which we're not completely sure that we've found the whole distribution as well, it could be found in other places within the near future. Um, and from a UK point of view, we are currently recommending that we would take statutory action, but this would be focusing on preventing the spread and cleaning up at the end of the season. So thank you very much for listening. Um, so if there's any questions, I'll hand over Adrian. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, there are a few questions. Um, and I think the first one will come down to uh, some definitions. So. Is tomato brown rugose fruit virus a quarantine pathogen in the UK? Um, we, as, as things currently stand, we would say we would take statutory action against it. So that would be under a plant health notice. So although it's not reg anywhere listed as a regulated organism, we would treat, be treating it as such at the moment. Does that make sense? Is it... Yeah, so I, I think it is worth pointing out that within the UK plant health regulations, that any disease that's deemed to be injurious to a plant is liable for, yes. for action to be taken if it's deemed to be of, of a sufficient threat. Yeah, there is within the legislation a line somewhere which mentions about um, plants not normally present within the territory. Um, that you can take action on those. So there is, it would be take, action would be taken under that piece of legislation. So there's a few questions about what actions would be taken. Um, so one, um, would plant, plant health seed inspector order total crop, crop destruction? Um, I think that's highly unlikely, uh, given the way we've dealt with similar viruses and viroids in the past. Um, there's always the case that it's a case by case basis. Um, and we would probably, I think to clean this up, you would be relying on having a crop break at some point, which I know for some growers is, is not their normal production methods. Um, but in general, I don't think we would be requiring total crop destruction, no. Okay. <clears throat> so, given the emergence of anecdotal reports in Holland, at the EU meeting, do you know if it was mentioned um, about a need for EU member states to inform other member states when an outbreak is present? Um, I... I don't know what exactly was mentioned concerning Holland um, and the Netherlands. Um, I know that there are rumours that there have been outbreaks and um, from an official point of view, I don't believe they have officially, they have said there are no outbreaks. So I, I can't really comment on the situation in the Netherlands.
I think that's that's fair enough that we can only go with the official reports. Um, would you take measures against organic soil crops at the end of the season if infected? So that's probably thinking about risk of things like carryover in roots. Um, that, that's probably one of the sort of case by case situa situations. I haven't specifically considered uh, organic crops, but yes, I do under understand there that rather than growing in rock wool, you'd be in, in some kind of soil or compost. Um, I think we'd have to consider what the risks would be associated with, for example, the roots being left behind and probably be taking advice from Adrian on that one, I expect, amongst others. Nicely passed, yes. Um, so I think, given the time, uh, I think there are a few questions to pass back to Heiko. If you're still with us, Heiko? I'm still with you, yes. Can you okay. still hear me? Uh, I can still hear you. So within the German outbreaks, was there a time gap between the reporting from the different German crops? Um, no, I think they, um, uh, within North Rhine-Westphalia, the different growers, they work very closely together and it was all detected very at the very same time, basically, if that answers your question. Yeah, I think that does. Um, and within um, the German outbreaks and the disinfection advice, are you giving any specific advice on things like knife disinfection for de-leafing and things like that? Um, we can only give the general advice um, that's been given um, in the instructions from the commercial disinfectant uh, where they tested the um, times you need to successfully inactivate TMV. That's the only we can do because we haven't um, done any experiments to test it with this virus, actually. Okay. And I, th I think that's part of the problem that we're still in quite early days and yeah. a lot of the work still needs to be done specifically on this virus. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think just checking through the questions, um, do you know what the perceived source of infections was in Germany? Uh, not out of my head. Um, no, sorry, I can't answer you that. Okay, that's fair enough. And again, I think as a plant pathologist, we always come in after the outbreak, don't we? Yeah, and, yeah. and we also have the system in Germany that we have 16 uh, federal states and uh, each federal state has their own plant protection organization that is dealing with the growers. And once um, there is a problem in the federal states, JKI comes into place, assisting in diagnostics, and JKI, a different department from mine, needs to be notified if it's a new notifiable disease. So we are basically the third in line when it comes to new outbreaks and confirmation of that. Um, so, yes, I regret a little bit that I cannot be hands-on in the greenhouses and uh, look at the situations myself. Um, do we know how the Israelis have dealt with the problem and how they are doing it now? So, looking at different biocides, hygiene, best practice? I have, have no just got the information that... Afraid. No, I think we've only got the information we, we've, we've got to go on. Okay. Um, there is a question about cross-protection and is anyone working on a mild strain for the virus? Not that I'm aware of. Um, no, so aware of what that. was found in Israel is very similar to what was found in Jordan. And again, what we found in Germany is also very similar to uh, those two viruses. And at the moment, there is not much um, sequence difference. Uh, we only know that uh, different tomato varieties have a different uh, or differential behavior when it comes to symptoms. Um, but we do not know if there's any uh, mild strain available. Um, and I have no knowledge if someone is um, intentionally mutating the virus to generate mild strains. 
Uh, so again, I think that comes under it's still very early days, isn't it? Yeah. Um, as far as we can tell, everything's pretty much identical, so we, we don't have a mild strain to work with. Yeah. Um, and so do we know which tomato varieties are more susceptible or less susceptible? I think they're all susceptible, but um, the symptom development is different. On some, you get more leaf symptoms, and on others, you only observe the fruit symptoms. But in the end, uh, we have not heard about a single resistant variety yet. Okay. Um, well, I think I'll pick up the final question here, um, which is, can you tell us what work is going on in the UK at Ferra, for instance? Mm -hmm. So I think I'm probably the best place to answer that question. Um, so from our point of view, we have proposed some work to look at survival and disinfection for the virus. Um, so we are hoping to look at a series of different disinfectants and to see how effective they are on uh, disinfecting for the virus across different surfaces. And we're also hoping to look at survival of the virus on uh, different surfaces and on hands. Um, and just do some basic work on things like hand washing so we yeah. can add into that hygiene best practice work. Uh, and I think that's us just about wrapped up for time. So, Natalie, do you want to pick up and say anything to finish? Um, just to finish, there are, have been some questions that haven't been answered. We've had loads through, so thank you for those. Um, what I will do is try to collate um, an, an FAQ document um, and work with our speakers and team here to try and answer everything as best we can. Yeah. Um, and then I will publish that on the website alongside this webinar. Um, so hopefully you, you'll get all the answers that we have at the moment. And if not, um, please email me, as I said, um, natalie.key at ahdb.org.uk and I will do my best to, to answer your questions. Okay, well, thank you very much everyone and thank you to the speakers, very much appreciated. Thank um, and thank you to Adrian for hosting. You did a great job. Are you there still? <laughs> yes. Sorry, I, was, I was doing my classic of speaking on mute. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll leave you to finish up then. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So um, how do we finish the broadcast? Is that... I can close it. It's just if you wanted to say anything else, that's all. Um, I, th I think that's all, all we can say for now. As you say, we will collect the answers to the questions we haven't had time for. Thank you to everybody for, for listening and thank you once again to our speakers. Um, I think that's been a very useful way to spend an hour. Yes, thank you very much. All right, bye. Bye.